Okay, and finally, here's, I printed off every single question, and I, I covered most of it, I think, already, but every single question off of YouTube. Um, is there a benefit if you build the whole greenhouse three feet under the surrounding soil to have a constant soil temperature, even in the winter? Saw it done by Chinese guys. No, there isn't where I live because the sun angle is too low, like I... Uh, just explain. Wallapinis don't work. If I drop my greenhouse three feet in the ground, I'd have snow accumulation problems on the polycarbonate, which would then shade the sun coming in, and I'd have to build a bigger structure. So you can build it into the north side of the wall. The Chinese style greenhouses, they do like a rammed earth clay uh, north wall, which is great. Like that's, that's thermal mass. Maybe it's even cheaper, like if you can't get a good deal on insulation, but that's thermal mass and, uh, and then they heat that up with a dark metal. That's great. That, that works really good. What type of windows are the best to use? I know you use Reclaim bus windows, but in the best case scenario, if the budget is not a concern, what would you use? Two or three layer windows. Um, okay, for growing plants, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but on a passive solar house, I did... I got the most expensive windows money could buy. They're triple pane, double argon filled, uh, low E, except on the south side, um, which has an R value of 8.1 on a, on the glazing, which is phenomenal. Man, it's getting hot in here. I got to open some more doors. Um, it's only minus 30 Celsius outside today. Okay. Um, on my house, I did that, but I didn't, on the south windows, put the low E coating because I want as much sun as possible in the winter, and those windows are shaded from the sun in the summer anyways. So low E coating is useless. In a, in a greenhouse, I'd have to double check. Like, each glazing of the glass is more light that gets stopped for your plants. Um, polycarbonate and the poly I used is your best bang for the buck. I would do that over a glass greenhouse. If it hails in a glass greenhouse, you're gonna have glass shattered everywhere. If it hails in a polycarbonate greenhouse, you're just gonna have dents. Uh, glass problem. Glass is breakable, not gonna last forever. You're gonna have seals go on it anyways. Polycarbonate, I'm hoping to get 25 years out of it. The bus windows I got are double pane bus windows and I've had no problem with light transmission. I don't even know there might be a coating on there, but. I just, just, money is a factor all the time, so I just use that. Um, yeah, so a passive, passive solar house, I would still do triple pane windows if you live in as harsh an environment like I do. Argon, yes. N low E coating, no. And then properly uh, save it for, uh, protect it from the heat of the summer sun. Yeah, for plant growth, I don't know, you got to look that up. To see what the glazing is, what the argon is for light transmissibility. But uh, I calculated it for polycarbonate and 6 mil greenhouse poly together, the light transmission, and it worked perfectly. For the, my other windows, I just got the cheapest used windows because only a little bit of light's going to come in like in the morning on one little triangle side and the evening on the other triangle side. So it, it didn't, didn't make a big difference. Look for my videos on double-double windows and double-double doors. So in extreme harsh climate like I do live in, I invented kind of the double-double window, which is two double-pane windows in the same hole with an airspace in between, and same for garden doors or any door. And that, that like in the greenhouse, um, there's no heat loss on my door, but I also don't care about light transmissibility. So again, if I did like double double windows, I it might block out too much sun. In fact, I think it probably would that your plants would not be happy. They need more natural light. In a passive solar greenhouse, if prop properly done as to your guidance, is it a good way to pick up chicks? It is. Yes and yes. So and the good chicks too. So <laughs> that's funny. That that made me laugh when I read that. Yeah. Have you thought about implementing a biodigester in your system? It's free gas and fertilizer. So uh, I know very minimal about that, but short answer, no. I'm going to do fish tanks, and the fish tanks create um, 
fertilizer for my plants and when I do fish tank changeovers, that's fertilized for, for my plants. And then they give off carbon dioxide gas, which is beneficial for plants. That's a plant food gas. Um, composting bin, I think it would smell up my, in, my enclosed environment. So here's another example. If you don't live in as harsh an environment as Mars, which we have to deal with in Saskatchewan, like literally it's warmer on Mars than it is in Saskatchewan at some points uh, during the year but it's completely closed up. So if you have just a hoop house or something that's drafty, you know, you, you're able to... It's getting so hot in the greenhouse this time, the camera overheated. So let's try this again. I don't know if you can see all the fog of the air mixing, but I have a door wide open, minus 30 Celsius outside, getting so hot the camera overheated in the sun inside, right? So right now in the greenhouse, it's... My concrete, black concrete, is nice and warm and it's collecting that. I don't have any water in the in-floor heat pipes, but that's going to heat up the water. My fish tanks, I only have two going. Eventually, I'm going to have like eight at the back. Black fish tanks that are going to collect that. And it's literally so hot that you have to open up doors and mix the air. So, anyways, <clears throat> where was I? biodigester system be pretty smelly in the greenhouse and I prefer fish tanks because fish gives me food as well uh, protein and fertilizer and carbon dioxide I'm building a, myself a subterranean one out of IBC tanks modeled after solar cities open design IBC biodigester yeah okay okay it's a uh, I had a wasp in here, there's a, or a mason bee or something on me. Yeah, yeah, biodigester, I, I know a little bit, but I'm going to do fish tanks. Compost pile, people say, well, can't you just do a compost pile and get lots of heat out of it? Probably not enough, and just pass, I'm a passive guy. This doesn't screw up. The sun and the building and insulation doesn't screw up, so it just works. I have no hydronic heating, nothing extra. And just, yeah, if I don't want to use wood, then a little bit of natural gas at night time. And who cares, right? There's less stuff to, to screw up. That's, that's my whole thing. Um, thanks for putting out all the information. How do you deal with pest control? Do you have soil rotation? What would you have done differently to make something better? Okay, well, pest control... <clears throat> Yeah, the same problems for most of the year when it's opened up as outside, like pests. So last year we had these little beetles everywhere for some reason, outside and inside. But the pest control is as soon as the bugs die outside because it's too cold and we close up the greenhouse, then we have issues um, that we have to deal with. So I we do that by trying to introduce lots of beneficial insects. And then also homemade insecticidal soap, with, which is just vegetable oil and dish soap. And spray that. So this year it was a white fly problem. Last year it was aphids. This year the white flies killed our, sucked enough juice out of the cucumber leaves that it killed those. We had to pull our peppers plants. We were able to get a harvest out of them first. And our tomato plants. Um, I have a tobacco plant that's... Um, uh, aphids really like so if I see aphids uh, present on the tobacco plant that that's aphids favorite or pepper plant it's essentially it's a hands-on you have to deal with the pests now again once I have better air exchanging system more carbon dioxide I think uh, less humidity that's going to fix some of the bug problems like uh, bad bugs and problems in any garden outside or inside is from there's something wrong with your environment that you should address. So as a steward of steward of the land outside, inside, me the architect and I'm essentially playing God in my environment, right? Um, uh, we did see the odd mealy bug on um, some banana leaves and passion fruit leaves so the wife literally with rubbing alcohol 
uh, wipe down all the leaves and it takes a lot of your time. You got to really enjoy it too, but uh, yeah. Soil rotation, not really. I'm trying to do uh, this living soil like we do outside. So I brought in good soil. One of my problems is I probably have too much compost in there. The soil's too rich, so we might have scabs on some of our root crops or something. That's one problem we have outside. I literally made the soil too rich. I need to add some more clay and crappy stuff to it. Um, cedar mulch is great. I don't think that's the cause of any bug problems. This, the mulch that we use outside keeps a lot of the moisture in the soil. It's called a back to Eden method of gardening and that worked really good in the greenhouse in the summertime. Um, one problem that we'd have is that blossom end rot on, oh, I think that's what it is, on the bottom of a tomato. And that's because the tomatoes got too dry and then too wet and stuff. And the mulch kind of equalized that out for in the summertime. Um, and I don't think that contributed to any bug problems in the winter time in the greenhouse. So it is working and it smells very nice in here. It's fresh, a hint of the cedar mulch, you know, it's very nice. Aphids and spider mites, yeah. Yeah, I kind of covered that. So beneficial bugs, insecticidal soap on aphids and be on it, right? Uh, I've got to learn to, if I see the slightest problem, if I see a few aphids forming, I'll hit them with insecticidal soap. Those white flies, I had no idea how fast they'd reproduce. It was nuts. So at the first sign of something, you have to deal with it. Best soil mix. So yeah, it's... Uh, when I clean out the goat barn and chicken coop, I pile that up so that I have compost out of that. Um, you know, all of our scraps and weeds go into the, the chicken coop, and then you can sift that into the greenhouse and get nutrients out of that. I've got, I got a whole bunch of composted wood chips out of the old city landfill or uh, clean fill site that I used, and that's super high in nutrients, like the wife does a soil test and it's like super high NPK. It's almost, I have too much compost is one problem in, in our garden outside. Our potatoes had little scabs on it. It might be because it's slightly alkaline as well, but it was literally too rich. Even our carrots had some signs of uh, scabbing on it because it was too rich. So I should actually add some crappy clay or something as filler to reduce the amount of compost that I have. But yeah, uh, like so, some of this is my is my wife's department um, as well. I'm a builder and I'm learning all the time. Like now I'm learning about vapor pressure deficits and things. Like I, I know how to build the building that's gonna work and then I take things as I come. So uh, yeah. Would it be beneficial to put animals like rabbits? Like I said, they smell, smell it up in here. I, even if you clean them twice a day <clears throat> to maintain the heat. Uh, I don't think they'd give off enough heat that it makes a difference. It would be more for carbon dioxide, I guess. Um, how small a greenhouse is feasible for the design you have created. You could do a deep winter greenhouse in any size. You could do an eight by 12 backyard greenhouse. Um, but essentially, if you build the if it, the building's built properly, whether that's a passive solar house, a passive solar shop, or a passive solar greenhouse, all which have different characteristics and designs, it's almost like the bigger the better. So if you do the proper insulation, the proper sun angles, the proper glazing, the bigger it is, the more thermal mass it is. When you do an air change over, like for example, in here, if I oh open up a door in a 3,000 square foot greenhouse, it only is gonna exchange a little bit of air. If I walk into an eight by 12 deep winter greenhouse, the entire air in there is gonna ch change. Just like my small house, it, it works, but it's too small. So in the heat of the summer, if it's plus 30 Celsius outside and I go in and in and out of that house 20 times, the wife 10 times, and the kids 400 times. That door is open, exchanging air closed, open, closed. If my house was 10 times the size with the same construction, that house would stay cooler. So more thermal mass in a big building. And again, if you have a, if this is a footprint and you 
double the size of it, you only have more this much more exterior walls. So this has a lot of exterior walls per the square footage. And this has way more square footage for the percentage of interior walls. So, but it, it does, it, the concept does work on smaller ones if that's what you're thinking too, so. Do you have easy to understand blueprints and instructions for every step? We did a, um, I did a full construction video of me building it, literally everything. And f for somebody actually going to do a greenhouse like this, uh, there's a, 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 far, a farmer in Alberta that literally off of the YouTube video built exactly what I did because he's like me. He can like observe something and knows every step of the way because he's handy, whatever. And he built exactly what I did with some modifications that are good, like uh, extra hydronic heating in a layer of sand just under the concrete. A couple things like that. So off of that YouTube video, somebody that's handy and knows about building can build it off of that. Um, blueprints, I still don't have a blueprint. I never used a blueprint. It was all in my head for the... But these are the measurements. Okay, if you can't, can't see that very well, uh, my greenhouse, the main part of the building from the post to the back wall is 32 feet. The interior ceiling height at the peak where the posts are is 15 feet. At the back of the greenhouse, the interior ceiling height is 11 foot 3 inches. The polycarbonate panels are at an exact 45 degree angle and they're exactly 16 foot sheets of polycarbonate. Um, the front part of the greenhouse from the pole to the pony wall on the outside where the polycarbonate is, is 11 feet. The raised bed in front is four feet deep and after concrete and I built it up, it's two feet on the inside and closer to three feet pony wall on the outside. It kind of goes down. The bus window wall is two feet. So that the between the, on the inside, the raised bed's two feet, the bus windows are two feet to the polycarbonate. And it, it's that portion of the building sticks out 11 feet, four feet up, 15 feet here at a 45 degree angle. It like, that's exactly what it is. Now, again, if you live at a different latitude, don't build it exactly like I do. If you live further south in a milder climate, you probably want, um, to make it higher and not as deep because your winter sun isn't as deep and there's no point of having it as deep. Like this is a deep winter greenhouse because my sun goes in deep because it's at such a low angle. So giving you blueprints is almost, of my exact greenhouse is almost uh, non-beneficial to anyone unless they're directly at my latitude. What is the formula for the angles of facing the sun? Okay, the formula is trigonomic tan functions. I covered that. So you have to figure out what, what values you know in a right angle triangle to figure out your sun. So you know the sun angle. You can input that angle. With a right angle triangle, that means you know that all of the angles in a triangle is equal to 180 degrees. Then you need to know one side, and from knowing one side, you can figure out the other two sides using trigonometry, cos, sin, tan functions, very simple trigonometry math. And you can figure out uh, all that information. I'll do another whiteboard video on that, the, the whole process. Um, do you supplement... Uh, the sunlight with artificial light in the winter. I do not. My initial plan was maybe put some LED lights, but uh, honestly, it's working so good. Everything's growing. So, mind you, slower than outside because it's cooler at night. It gets down to 10 degrees Celsius at night and those less daylight hours. Everything's slower, um, but everything still grows. The only supplemental light we have is when I do a, a hydroponic, aquaponic thing, integrating with the fish tanks at the very back of the greenhouse, I'm going to have some supplemental LED lights and then our racking for our microgreens and my wife's uh, where she starts seeds. Like we've got onions going now and microgreens and, and lots of things in trays. Um, those need a little bit more supplemental light. So 
on our racking, we do have LED lights and the LED lights are so efficient, they don't use that much electricity really. But for the whole greenhouse, I'm not gonna bother. It's too much electricity, too much equipment. No, thank you. I'll deal with ever so slightly slower growth. So I can plan things like establish things in, in fall that'll grow big enough that if their growth stops, it's okay or something, but um, yeah. What is the square footage of your growing space compared to the square footage of the building? Well, the whole building's growing space. So even the concrete is growing space. On the concrete, I can have nice racking with wheels. I can have potted plants. I can do tables with all of our plant starters. If I do a plant sale it'll, with all potted plants, it's gonna be all in the concrete. So the entire building will be used other than uh, square footage of the bathroom, sauna, and hot tub, essentially. Um, so concrete's growing as well. Actually, if I wanted to reduce vapor pressure and my humidity, you could do a greenhouse like this, all concrete and no in-ground growing. And uh, you'd have less of a hu humidity issue probably. And then you could just do hydroponics, potted plants, something like that. But for me, it's essentially half of the greenhouse footprint is in the ground, like actual soil, just like outside. So the main bed and the raised bed in the front, that's half of the footprint of the greenhouse. The other half is concrete. So um, I didn't know exactly what's gonna work and I want some redundancy and I like experimenting with different things. So I can experiment with potted plants, in-ground growing, aquaponics, hydroponics, uh, growing up the walls, tower gardening, mm, uh, racking for microgreens and it's a very multi-purpose greenhouse. If I wanted to do it as a business, maybe you just concrete the whole thing, put up a whole bunch of microgreen racks and you could probably make one heck of a good living a building this size, just microgreens on concrete, right? What is the square footage of your growing space compared to the square footage of the building, including the water, rocks or whatever you use for heat retention? Um, here are a few questions that first come to mind. Haha. <laughs> look back. Yeah, look up back at some of my previous videos if you got a lot of time. I don't know how long this thing's going to be, but it is what it is. If you're interested, hopefully it's helpful. I noticed your wood stove in the greenhouse. I was wondering if you're familiar with the rocket mass heater, batch box wood stoves that use way less wood and extract minimum heat that, uh, Okay, yeah, rocket mass heaters, th those are kind of cool, right? You kind of deflect the flue to go in a thermal mass to kind of heat up some rock or sand or whatever thermal mass. The, okay, except for the, the wood stove that I have in the greenhouse is about one of the biggest you can get, and it's an antique one. It's called a Elmira Stove Works. It was actually built in uh, Ontario, Canada. That thing is a big wood stove, and it's got catalytic converters in it. So I start start a fire in it, and then I once it's going and getting hot, I close a plate, the flue, which directs all the smoke and heat. It kind of burns and goes through this a catalytic converter on each side, and then out the chimney. So that thing is super efficient for a large size wood stove. For a small wood stove like the one I have in my house, it's a... Uh, airtight wood stove that has baffles in the top that does like a double burn of some of the gases. Wood gasification technology works really good in a small wood stove. Um, a rocket mass heater, you know, I've seen people build them. They, it's like a box, a steel box with a door, and then they run the flue through some thermal mass. I would argue an, a new technology airtight wood stove with gasification principles is more efficient and a big catalytic wood stove like I have is more efficient. Uh, when I get around in my spare time to finishing my sauna, I'm gonna be putting some brick and thermal mass around it. I'm gonna put, integrate some uh, around the chimney, some copper, uh, copper piping I'll wrap the chimney with to heat some water and integrate that into my big hydronic heating system. So, Rocket mass heaters are cool, but uh, with the technology we have today, uh, wood gasification so stoves, catalytic stoves are arguably better. So 
if you have the money to spend on a really expensive stove, get yourself a soapstone fireplace. These things, you, you actually have to build structure into your house to hold the amount of soapstone for what these ways, but I, what these weigh, but it's kind of like a rocket mass heater, but it's like a super efficient gasification stove with a bunch of soapstone around it. And soapstone um, retains heat more than any other rock on the planet. Or if you're doing a rocket mass heater yourself, maybe instead of just a, bo a burning box, you could do a high efficient wood stove. And then, uh, you know, thermal mass around it. But yeah, they're, they're cool, but uh, this is easier. And I'm just going to put thermal mass around it. And arguably, it's more efficient. Somebody, Verge Permaculture has an excellent video covering benefits of a masonry heater fireplace. Okay, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that. I had, like, I, I went through a lot of house when I was flipping them and moved around, like, once a year, pretty much. But a uh, few houses I had built in the 70s, they had a brick fireplace in it. And that thing in the our winter, you could have a roaring fire in there, and it's so efficient. All the heat and everything just goes up the chimney. And then I get what you're saying, rocket mass heaters, well, instead of straight up the chimney, do it like through something but today it's wood gasification super super efficient wood stoves I, I can't remember what they burn at but a wood gasification stove might burn at like 85 percent efficiency so there's less smoke or barely any smoke once it's going and 86 percent efficiency is awesome maybe a open fireplace built out of brick with a big flue is maybe 10% efficient, like I would imagine. But yeah, anyways, it's the more efficient you can get something, the better, the more thermal mass you have, the better. Full breakdown on the cost involved, I did that. All cost breakdown for each system in the greenhouse, I kind of covered that. A spreadsheet would be nice and helpful. Well, I, I said that, so just take notes while you're doing that. I'm putting this all in a video and you can take what you want from it. How would something like this work in different growing zones in the USA? So it's all about your sun angles. I would do slight changes, figure out all your sun angles. So you probably wouldn't do it as deep as me, and you probably want to go a little bit higher as me. And if you live in a place that has no snow load, maybe you want a lower slope like like uh, Curtis Stone's greenhouse, Verge Permaculture's greenhouse all have snow load issues. But if you don't have any snow load, then maybe that's good for you. The Chinese style greenhouse has snow load issues. Um, so they put vibrators on their me the metal frame to zip the snow off, whereas mine just naturally no problem does that. So my greenhouse is built for my exact location. If I was building somebody a greenhouse for their location, um, it might be slightly different. That said, anywhere in the northern hemisphere, I mean, you don't have to be exact with your sun angles. You want to know you know, pretty close to where the sun's going to react. You know, if you spent all the time in designing a passive solar house, if you screw something up on a passive solar house, have too much glazing, not the right overhang, you know, the it's all free information. It's all in the design. You know, your heating bill is going to be more and your cooling bill is going to be more. But yeah, every everywhere is different. Use Figure out that trigonometry and uh, figure out your solstice angles. Do, you know, pay attention outside when it gets warm out, when it gets cold out, when you want the sun, when you don't want the sun, where you want the sun to hit. Yeah, I, I do that, but. Ways to save cost on sourcing cheap or free materials. So I covered that in this one, I think, but the best is Cull lumber. So cull lumber is imperfect lumber that's crooked and a purlin is or a girt is what goes uh, perpendicular to your trusses or the posts on your wall. So I could use hockey sticks and boomerangs. It's just to tie the building together, tie the trusses together and just to screw the tin on. So that's literally 50% savings if your lumber yard uh, uh, can give you that deal. Same as me. Uh, repurposed trusses saved me 10 grand. Uh, would have been better to get structurally engineered exact trusses for this exact vault and everything, but $10,000, $10,000. Insulation, that's always been my biggest savings. So saving a ton of money on that. 
I used bus windows, uh, that was big savings, all used doors and windows, used overhead door, got a dented furnace, do everything yourself, do all the rebar, in-floor heat, do everything yourself is always your biggest savings. Um, got used wood stoves, even my hot tub is used, like a new hot tub, I couldn't believe it's 15 grand, but my hot tub was 2,500 bucks, awesome. Um, yeah, as much used as you can. Uh, so, you know, me that it's not made of money, I can't, I can't hire labor to do something. I don't have $200,000 to buy new material and hire labor and hire somebody to build it. When I build myself a barn next year, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not going to pay labor. I'm going to do it myself. Um, I'm going to use call lumber. I'm going to buy new trusses probably for that building. But I have all the used tin. You know, if I see a deal, I drop what I'm doing and I go get it. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. So I have a truck to do that, flat deck trailer to do that, dump trailer to do that. If there's a wood chips or something, I have a grain truck. I can go get wood chips. Um, I, you know, make my own soil and compost and yeah, tons of ways to save money. It's, uh, you know, if you, but if you're super rich, you just hire everything out and your project's done really fast. So, okay, where am I here? Ideas of ways to augment income in order to get money to pay for a system. So, uh, yeah, like, you, I could I could dedicate just all just the greenhouse guy but so for me I have my my freeze-dried food business that you know I spend a lot of my time on and stuff and keep all my customers happy and it provides value to way more people than just a few people that I could feed doing this but I could dedicate my time and a system to this and probably make a good living just on microgreens or just uh, starting plants and having plant sales or something. I could probably make a good living. Um, but uh, for me, it's uh, like, why do you want to build something like this? So I built it because I know how to do it. I built it because I, you know, I'm smart enough to figure out all the angles, source material, save a bunch of money. So it didn't cost me all that much. And, you know, instead of an old, old pontoon boat, I decided this was more important for me. This provides better food for my family. We can come in here, our winters are terrible. It's nice for our health. Um, and then I, because of my design and how I built it, I don't have a bunch of ongoing costs. Like what it, if it's a thousand dollars a uh, winter in natural gas, winter in, uh, natural gas and electricity to run fans. If it's a thousand dollars, who gives a shit? If I produce nothing out of this and just had this to come in and it's a thousand dollars, I don't feel like burning wood even thousand dollars a year whatever um it's still worth it for me but now that i i have this and it provides value um so uh it's funny i like i'm still feel like i'm getting started myself right so i do things myself from bare land to where i am now and i'm creating kind of these systems like i create systems with my businesses uh and things I'm creating infrastructure and a system that when it is time that I can finally afford to hire some help or something, if I have all the problems worked out of the greenhouse, doesn't have much that much cost, and I can hire labor where somebody can manage a greenhouse this size with eight hours a day, five days a week, micro green operation, packaging, everything, everything. Um, and it's worth it to pay that labor, you know, uh, you can make a living. There's ways to make a living out of something like this. Again, you're not going to get rich. Uh, in order to get rich in today's world, get a government job with a government pension. So that means you have to go somewhere, not really provide any value, don't really work hard, there's no work ethic, and just you have to go sit there, but then you waste your life away. Uh, there's other easier ways to make money than, than farming, I guess. But um, for my resilience, health, everything, uh, you know, uh, preparations for, and, and for where I see things in the future, this makes a lot of sense to me. Is the system scalable? Uh, yes. So the most scalable greenhouse, uh, that I've seen is the Chinese style greenhouse. So they, there's this, uh, that guy in, uh, Alberta, his, 
what's his name? Mr. Dong. I forget his first name. Uh, Mr. Dong. Yeah, I think he's in old Alberta, but uh, yeah, he scaled it. So it's just more poly, more of the frame systems, more roller blankets and built it way cheaper than me. Like he, he doesn't, didn't have to pay for any insulation. I don't think maybe just a little bit, but uh, it rammed earth wall. That's, that's pretty good. So for a scalable system, he's probably closest, but, but mine would be, you know, get, get your trusses, my, my design, and then did a slightly different, like the Chinese style design. Don't put any concrete, don't put any in-floor heat, put that Chinese roller blanket. Don't do a climate battery. Don't do any extras, just dirt like this. It, it would be almost a cross between mine and a Chinese style greenhouse to get the cost down and go. But again, for business, um, if you just did a bunch of hoop houses and put some massive natural gas furnaces in and paid the natural gas, um, but you were, uh, you know, it's, it's worth it to pay that extra natural gas in a hoop house for the amount of production that you might get out of it. So for a business, but, but this is kind of in between for me. I don't want to be burdened by having a greenhouse that has a massive operating cost. Uh, I want passively not a burden so if i don't feel like making microgreens i don't have to because now that this is built it costs me almost nothing right what steps should be done first and last i don't know if that's like homesteading life or whatever but i almost wish i would have built a bigger better barn first just because uh greenhouse is a lot to maintain and a lot of hands-on whereas a bigger properly built barn I know that there's a, a market for goats um, and goats with a proper livestock guardian, proper pasture fencing, enough goats to handle what feed is on there and then bailing up so you have enough feed for them and then just cleaning out the barn every once in a while, do some automatic or bale feeders, automatic waters. Uh, once I create my goat system, that probably makes more passive money for me I almost, before I built this, I should have built a barn first, possibly, but I, uh, it's whatever. Uh, before you do this, build a chicken coop. That's more bang for your buck. Um, I started with just a crappy little hoop house to slightly extend our growing season in the spring and the fall. Didn't work very good because it's, it's so cold, but it did help and it didn't cost me anything. Um, but yeah, when you, on a homestead, you want to also start with a, a centralized shop to store your building material and tools and everything else for every other system you're going to do. So my shop's in the middle and then I have like greenhouse and pond and growing on one side and then livestock which has manure and poop and noise on the other side and the chickens are close to the goats but everything's my shop is my hub of the the system. Yeah, cost associated with upkeep and maintenance. So once it's built, you know, it's going to last a long time with, with tin everywhere, insulations forever, concretes forever, um, and every 10 to 25 years, uh, another $4,000 to replace the polycarbonate. Every 5 to 10 years, replace the greenhouse poly at a cost of... I forget what that was, 200 bucks? I think it was like 200 bucks for a piece of poly to do that size. So not much. Monthly cost to operate, I covered that. Hopefully this gets the ball rolling. Yep, that's a lot of questions. I hope I answered them all. Thank you so much for all those questions. I found answer to some of these questions in a video. Okay, that's great. I try, I try to cover everything. And I'm honest and don't lie, but it's just so much information to try to go through. Um, have you thought about data independence? I mentioned it before, I think. I'm just curious what you even think of this sort of thing. I'm somewhat a data hoarder. Okay, so that's not greenhouse related. That's preparedness related. Um, but yeah, if we lose the internet or the government doesn't allow us certain videos on the internet or information on the internet or something... That's where I get a lot of my information from. So if I lost that resource and I'm stuck with just my library of books, I have a lot of books. 
but and not enough time to read through them, right? So if I'm looking for an answer to a question, I will go to the internet over a book. I could probably find it in the amount of books that I have, but but yeah, um, data independence. What I should do is get some soup, spend the time, get more computer storage, and start downloading YouTube videos and important podcasts on economics, farming, greenhouses, uh, all that stuff. Because if we lose that, that's a lot of information lost. I mean, me, I can only store so much in my head. Um, another cool, cool reason I'm doing YouTube podcasts and things. The podcast is it's easier for me to get my thoughts out and it, and we all listen to audiobooks like nobody barely has time to read. I listen to audiobooks in the background while I'm doing something for my efficiency. So for me to sit down and read a book, uh, I can't I can't do it. But I put that these this information out for even just my boys information to have a record and I save and back up all of the videos and podcasts. So my boys, if they're interested, hey, when dad was 33 years old and when he was starting a homestead and stuff. What was going through his mind? What was his ideas? And my boys can look back. If we lose that information, I have that data bank of stuff. It's like I wrote a book to my boys, but it's in the form of podcasts and then these videos, right? And then even for me, I, I'm already forget. I just turned 36 years old, by the way, but I have trouble remembering faces, names, authors, titles of books, titles of movies, because when I consume something, it's like I consume too much. I only take in the the super relevant information and my brain somehow gets rid of it. So for me to have, uh, you know, a data bank of just me and my thoughts at the time is awesome. But then some of the best economists, like if I could record every Peter Schiff podcast the or something as an economist or George Gammon or something or... Um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, or farming videos or something. It's that would be awesome. Uh, it might be worth doing that at this day and age with the stupidity in the system. And who knows if they might take down the internet, and then we a lot of information is lost. Thinking about doing something so similar. Yep, if for your area, get quotes. Like for other than the south end, the building's just a super high efficient building, pole building, super insulated with vaulted trusses. So any builder that builds pole buildings or agriculture buildings or any building can build you this. And then the south end, you know, they can figure it out. It's just, yeah, it's, and you can get a quote from them if you're not going to build it yourself and they can price out all the materials and the labor and how long it's going to take them and see what they come up with. But um, I know I got I got a, the last quote I got because I'm just running out of time. But I got a quote a few years ago before lumber went way up and stuff. But it was, uh, what was it, a 40 by 100 pool building or something with 16 foot ceilings. Uh, so that was just poles, no overhead door. No man door, but framed in for it. Poles, the trusses, strapped with purlins and put tin on it. No insulation, no electric, no concrete, no finishing, no nothing. Just parts and labor, $100,000 for that a few years ago. And I'm sure it's more now. But for, for me, just because I'm not made of money and we only got so many resources, it's worth my time and I enjoy the process to do things for myself. And that's how I save, save money. Um doing it myself, finding deals. And that's literally the only way I can do things. Um, something else popped in my head. I didn't see it in the questions in this one, but somebody said, but uh, was asking about permits and government regulations and does government leave you alone or whatever. And my little loophole of freedom is getting agriculture zoning. So enough land where you have farm status. So, and I fully utilize all of my farmland more, more so than anyone else. So I've got two pastures, hayland, shelter belt trees, fruit orchards, production, and then greenhouse. Now, you could do a greenhouse like this on an acre, 10 acres where I'm at, but unfortunately they won't give you agriculture zoning. So you can't do agriculture buildings and you'll have to get a lot of permits and be taxed to death on it, I would imagine. So again, gover government gets in the way of um, 
everything good in the world. Uh, this is from my perspective. That's not like a moron that wrecks everything, but I'm a builder, entrepreneur, creator and things. And for me, government wrecks everything. So I could, if I had five acres, I could do incredible production with like greenhouses and things, but be permitted and taxed to death. I have no idea what tax rates or something, but for me, agriculture zoning, and apparently there's zonings, parts of Ontario, it's, it's very similar. In Alberta, it's similar. It's agriculture zoning status, and then building agriculture buildings, it's essentially no permits, no fees, no taxes for buildings that are for agriculture use and produce agriculture value. With this building, our intention is to do year-round production in the form of CSA boxes to the local community. It doesn't produce a ton, and I'm not going to get super rich off of it, but it's an agriculture building, growing food, blah, blah, blah. That's my loophole. So literally, if I had to pay tax on it um, or permit it, I probably actually wouldn't have done the greenhouse. So again, because of government, like literally it would have just stayed a dream in my head, but because I found that one loophole for my, and you know, different parts of the world, like in different parts of the States, one municipality could be different from another municipality directly next to it. And you get as far away from government as you possibly can that allows you to do good things that benefit humanity. Um, Another question popped to my mind that somebody didn't write on there. So my sunny days where I live, it's very sunny. So Calgary, Alberta is 333 sunny days a year. Uh, Regina, Saskatoon in Saskatchewan here, it's about 319 sunny days a year on average, which is a lot. So we're very sunny. I think the motto for one of the cities close to me is Saskatoon shines and they got a sun when you drive in or something. Um, so it's great for that. But somebody inquired where I live, I only get 170 days of sun. Will this work where I live? So on an overcast day, like right now, the sun kind of went away right now and um, I'm still picking up heat, not not as much heat from direct sun, but I'm still picking up heat. If it's super overcast, you're not going to pick up very much heat and your plants aren't going to be happy. So if you live in a place that's not as sunny, I'd seriously consider major alterations. So instead of a passive solar greenhouse, I'd almost do a super insulated building with some natural south facing light. If you're in the Northern hemisphere, um, some, but then a super insulated south wall with some really better windows that's an R8 or something, you, you know, because you're not going to get enough solar gain for your plants and then supplement with lighting. So essentially building a more of a passive solar house or building with maybe a little bit more glazing, but then instead of having to spend a little bit of money on heat, you spend a little bit more money on LED supplemental grow lighting. So I forget the, I think Prince Rupert in Canada. I took a thing of this. Prince Rupert in Canada. There it is. Prince Rupert is the least sunny Canadian city uh, with only 250 hours of sunshine per year. Holy cow. So that would not, this does not work at Prince Rupert in BC. Uh, there's another lady that has this really cool greenhouse. Go check it out. Um, uh, Jane Squire, I think it is. And she has a YouTube, but she's Salt Spring Island on the coast in very southern BC, like pretty much on the border of the US. And being on the coast, being where she is, it literally barely freezes. So uh, her greenhouse, it's just, just poly greenhouse, no insulation, and just a gutter style greenhouse, but it's huge. And she has bananas in there and all these tropical things. I'm so jealous of the size of this, this thing, but she, with just a hoop house, she can have all that because it literally almost never freezes in the winter. If it, uh, in one of her videos I watched, it was like her greenhouse at night stays three degrees Celsius warmer than outside. So if it gets to minus three Celsius outside where she lives, she's got a risk of frost in the greenhouse. Whereas where I live, minus 40 Celsius outside and I keep it 10 degrees Celsius. So 50 degree 
temperature differential. So what she's doing there works for her. And it's like life on easy mode. I almost wish I would have moved there. The, the amount of things you can do in a milder climate like that is amazing. And she did it. But, but for me, Saskatchewan is life in hard mode, right? It's similar to, to Mars. Like I, I said before, it is, it is hard to do stuff. So Nebraska is easy. So that oranges in the snow video, he's able to take that cold air underground outside and then like refresh the air in his greenhouse and heat his greenhouses. Don't use as much insulation, no climate battery, anything, but just that air intake that's underground. Uh, that doesn't work where I live. Uh, climate batteries don't work as good. So it, it, for me, it's super insulated and really know your sun angles. And so my design is the best for my location of where I live on the planet. And I think it's the best design in the world for super cold climate past a solar greenhouse. If you live in uh, Alaska on the coast, you actually have a better climate than we do in the middle of the prairies in Canada because the, the ocean is an equalizer. So, but I'm not sure how much sunlight you get and you're further north. So like parts of Alaska, none of it, Northwest territories, the sun doesn't shine for a good chunk of the year like my winter solstice is 14 degrees their winter solstice is probably negative 10 or something so they don't see the sun so obviously this doesn't work when you go that far for you if you live on the arctic tundra in nunavut or something you literally do a super insulated box with no windows and then use some sort of fossil fuel to create LED lights and air exchangers and things to grow food uh, indoors. This doesn't work where the sun doesn't shine, right? So, but yeah, so one person for sure did the exact greenhouse I did in Alberta. Um, and I got to meet meet him and that, that was very uh, cool to see that I had an influence because I do think, and he thinks I figured it out, right? It's the best plan. So he did one. Um, with all that information I put out, uh, you should be able to, if you're not handy, give it to a builder or something and they can figure out the dimensions. If you don't know math, you know, ask somebody, a smart person, you know, to do some basic trigonometry to help you out and figure that out. I'll do another video on that. And then, um, I, okay, I, I'm going to do, if you still need help, if you're actually like, Dean, with all of that information, I still can't figure it out or I want a second opinion or something. I'm going to do, I'm going to put a consulting thing on my website, I guess, before I release this video, I'll set it up. 500 bucks. I'll, I'll give you an hour of my time on a FaceTime or a phone call. And then I can calculate your sun angles if you're building passive solar house or a greenhouse. You can give me your information and I will help you give you the best advice for that, for your location, and uh, listen to your plans, what you have to say, what I'd change with your plans, and I'll do that. But 500, 500 bucks, an hour of my time, you can phone me later if you if you need, if we do it. Email me anytime you want if you got a little follow-up question or something, and we'll do that. So, but uh, I'm just short on time. I do so many things. So hopefully this video and my other videos are enough. If this was helpful for you, let me know in the comments, like subscribe. If you're not a subscriber yet, uh, I don't know, like and sh share whatever it is, but get this YouTube thing going for me. So I put this all up for free for the minimum compensation of some YouTube ad revenue and things. And, but I do think this information benefits humanity. Um, I've got a couple really cool things I'm working on to provide an actual, I can't even, I won't even announce that uh, yet, but for monetizing this, I mean, who cares? It's just design. Maybe somebody smarter than me can take all the information I gave you, just like I took a bunch of information from other people and made their designs better. Maybe somebody can take all my information and figure out some other revolutionary, super cool thing and make mine even better. So, uh, but for now, I think I got the best design in the world for super cold climates. And uh, thanks for watching.
I hope I answered all your questions. I really, uh, if you wrote them in that other video, I answered all those. So I, how long is this? Hours, but anyways, hopefully it was worth it. We'll leave it at that. Take care. Happy building and growing.